Baptist Church to all of you. They're, they're meeting right now as well as you would expect, but they send their love and their prayers to you all. Um, as I've, I've just said with Barry, I, I, am, I have been minister there for 17, 18 years now, and I'm also a, a chaplain at the hospital, and I expect, I hope that in what I'm going to share with you now, you'll probably see shades of both. So, in the name of Jesus, who comforts the uncomfortable and discomforts the comfortable, I hope I will be able to say something that is helpful for you all this morning. So imagine just for a moment, Jesus has been interrupted on his way to a very, very sick little girl, a 12-year-old girl. He's on his way through the crowd to an emergency. What could be more important then than a sick little girl? So what does he do? What would you do? Does Jesus say, sorry, can't stop, I'm too busy, I'm focused on the one thing that matters right now? I think that's probably what I would do. But no, we're told that Jesus stops. Despite all of the pressure, Jesus stops. Despite the pressing demands of the crowd all around him and the place that he is going, Jesus stops. He stops and notices a woman who is also in desperate need. A woman who has been in great need for many, many years, but also a woman who with extraordinary courage has reached out and touched in other um, translations the hem, or the edge of his cloak. Jesus stopped. As so often in Scripture, a tiny moment like this holds so much. So very briefly, let me just indicate what is held in this moment. She is a woman. Women at the time of Jesus do not touch men unless they're married. She is bleeding. And as I'm sure you all know, that has all of its own taboos. She's unclean. And she touches a man. She is breaking in that tiny moment, that insignificant moment in the middle of that huge crowd, she's breaking all of the religious, social, and purity rules. She reaches out and touches that man. And he stops. I'm guessing those in the crowd that may have seen this are expecting her to be reprimanded. That's what she was expecting, and that's what everyone else would expect. But notice, Jesus is just as willing to break all the rules as she is. Notice, too, in that moment, this tiny, tiny moment, that she touches what we're told is the edge of his cloak. A tiny detail, but with a treasure of meaning. Did you know that a rabbi's cloak was called his wings? If you did, then maybe, maybe, and perhaps the people of the time, maybe would have known Malachi, Malachi 4.2, where it says, But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. In his wings, with healing in his cloak. In his wings she touches him and power goes out of him in that moment. And she is healed. with utmost awareness, a presence which is hard for us to imagine, and compassion which goes beyond anything I think we've yet come to understand, Jesus stopped. He sees her. He sees her need. He sees her distress. He sees through everything that is wrong. He sees through 
all of the cultural norms and religious rules, all of the assumptions. In a funny way, very similar to the way that God had seen the unwanted and despised Hagar as she was lost in the desert of her own despair. And Jesus heals her. Glorious, wonderful, good news. But, there's a consequence, isn't there? As a result, Jesus is delayed. Delayed on the way to a very sick child. Because it's at that moment that a messenger arrives to tell Jairus, who is the, and a very important man, he's the lo- leader of the local synagogue. And the messenger says, it's too late. Jesus stopped, and now it's too late. And we need to feel that for a moment. Now there's no point, is there, in bringing Jesus to see this little girl. Now we know, I'm sure, how Jairus must have felt in that moment. And these are moments that I see almost every day in the hospital. A loving parent, shaken, hurting, numb, all hope seeming to have drained away. Words come to an end because there aren't words to express what has just happened. But what does Jesus have to say? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Just believe. These are the words that are spoken at just, just about every theophany. That is the appearance of God throughout Scripture. Do not be afraid. I'm told they're spoken 365 times in Scripture, which is one for every day of the year. Good news. Do not be afraid. Just believe. Again, Jesus is defying everything that seems like to be realistic, to be sensible, to be common sense in that moment. Don't be afraid, but my daughter is lost. Don't be afraid, but my daughter has gone. I'm not sure how, but isn't it wonderful how sometimes... (laughs) God's good, isn't it? How our songs, the videos, and things that we show come together because in that horrible moment, Jairus is able to summon up just enough courage, just enough belief, just enough faith to walk with Jesus, that horrible, horrible short walk home. There's no point. But what else can I do? It seems to me that just enough is more than enough for God. Just enough is more than enough for God. Just enough is enough. Have just enough faith to reach out, friends, to touch the hem of his cloak. What else do we have to cling to? Now, there must have been something, I'm sure you've heard this said before, but it occurs to me over and over again, there must have been something about this man, something about the way Jesus spoke, something, I think, even more in the way that he was present, in the way that he filled the space that he was in, that inspired just enough faith. Again now, allow your imaginations to carry you as we approach Jairus' home. The whole town would have been aware of this sadness. Towns were very small in those days, and doors were always open to the street. Professional mourners had gathered that day. 
They cried, they wailed, and sometimes I believe that these professional mourners would play music as well. Why? Why professional mourners? Well, they were an act of mercy. You may have seen on TV news programs and things, people in the Middle East making an awful lot of noise at funerals. Well, in a sense, it's an act of mercy because that noise that the professional mourners are making covers the family so that they don't have to hold back their own grief. There was no bottling up of grief. There was no pretending. But the family were held in a safe cocoon, if you like, of noise. But of course, Jesus is seeing things very differently. And he defies again what is expected in that moment. He says, why are you making such a fuss? Why are you all weeping? The child isn't dead. He's sleeping. And they laughed at him. Of course they did. Of course they laughed at him. So Jesus moves through this second crowd around this house, somehow clearing a way, and then he takes the little girl's heartbroken mother and father, and he's three closest followers, Peter, James, and John, and they walk into the house. She's not dead, he says. She's sleeping. Now, in a way, we might say, well, is she asleep, or is she dead? What, what does he mean? Well, I don't think it's any more complicated than the fact that sleep throughout Scripture is also a metaphor for death. In John 11, 11, Jesus says, asleep when he means death. Our friend Lazarus is asleep. But I am going to awaken him. But I also think what Mark is doing here is asking us to turn our minds to another passage in his own gospel, to the story of the seed and the plant. The seed goes into the ground, he says. It goes to sleep and then it brings forth new life. It rises. And this is what will happen to this little girl as a sign. A sign that the kingdom of God is here, present, alive. Heaven and earth are touching in this man. I am here. I am the way. I am the truth. I am life. Life has walked in through the door. Life is here, all of you. Do not be afraid. Life is here. Life stops and notices. Life allows himself to be interrupted. Life sees with the eyes of wisdom and compassion. Life sees through your guilt, your fear, your distress. Life heals. Life sees hope where there is no hope. Life clears away despondency, fear, and mourning. Life speaks the truth even in the midst of the very, very, very worst circumstances. Life has walked through this little girl's door. Now we know, don't we? Because we have the glorious benefit of hindsight. We know what Easter will bring. We know that this little girl is a sign of what Jesus will do. When the seed goes into the ground, it must fall asleep before it rises again and brings forth new life. The people laughed at Jesus. They mocked him. Despite the scorn, despite the disbelief, Jesus stepped into that room The noise of the crowd is behind us and the little girl lies on the bed. 
Jesus reaches out his hand and touches once again that which is untouchable. Not blood now, but the corruption of death. God in his Son reaches out. Life reaches out, touches that which is untouchable and speaks. That same voice that spoke in the very beginning. And in that moment, Mark uses Aramaic. Talitha. Kum. I don't know that I've ever heard more beautiful words. Get up, little girl. And she got up. Up she got, and we're told that she walked around the room. And Jesus said the most ordinary of things. He said, something to eat. This dying is hungry work. Life in all of its wonderful ordinariness, all of its glorious humanness has returned. Get up, walk, eat. So why does Mark in this moment use the Aramaic? I'm not going to get all technical on you here. I promise. But why does he use the Aramaic? Well, it's certain that Jesus and his followers would have been able to understand and to speak Greek, but... Their normal, everyday language was Aramaic. So what's special about these words? Why leave them untranslated? We know that these words made a profound impression on Mark because he recorded them in that way. Just as it comes to us today, Talitha, come. They were just plain, ordinary, everyday words. Words that you would use to wake up a sleeping child in the morning. Come on, sleepyhead, up you jump. But of course, that is precisely the point. Jesus, the life-giving power of God, is breaking into the everyday moment, just as it is into your every day, just as it is, into the normal here and now, into our reality here and now, into the ordinary details, every ordinary detail of your life, just as it is, nothing hidden. The kingdom is here. Right here, in the grief, in the muddle, in the mess. Right here. Right here in this church, right there in your homes, right there in the hospital. And all we are asked is to have the eyes to see it. Wake up. Do you recognize in the presence of all of these people, amongst your friends, amongst your relatives, yes, even amongst your enemies. Do you see him? Life. Even in their everyday drabness, pain, difficulties, ugliness, fears, awkwardness, anger, you can add to that list. There is the kingdom of God. And so the gospel writer uses the most everyday language that he can. can. Talitha, come. Up you jump, little girl. Up you jump, church. Do you hear it? Up you jump, church. Wake up, church. Open your eyes, church. Walk, eat, share, live. If you have just enough faith, you have no reason to be afraid here and now in the muddle and the mess. 
in all of the problems, all of the worries. If you have just enough faith, Jesus says, all things are possible here and now. Don't wait for tomorrow. Just as it is, because life is here and there is no reason to be afraid. Life. He is the one we are called to follow. And more than that, he is the one we are called to be, church. His body, his hands, his feet, his voice, his eyes that notice and see and love. So stop. Listen. See. Be present. As in him, so in us. As in him, so in us. Church stops and notices. Church allows itself to be interrupted. Church sees with the eyes of wisdom and compassion. Church sees through the guilt and the fear and the distress. Church sees through all of the rules that separate us from God. Church heals. Church sees hope where there is none. Church clears a way through the despondency, through the fear, through the mourning. Church speaks the truth, even in the midst of the very worst. By the power of God's grace, church walks into the world and with the love of God alone, raises up the broken, the lost, the despised and the downtrodden. Ainsbury Baptist Church, don't be afraid.